Race makes us crazy here in America. We're obsessed with it. This whole panel is devoted to race. Since the 1960s, we have devoted $15 trillion to the war on poverty and the great society. Most of it intended to, cro to close the very real racial disparities. The, the disparities are very real across different economic, social, and cultural indicators. But there has been really, they have been stubbornly persistent. Uh, this is because uh, rather than truly deal with the causes of the disparities, the bad schools, the out of wedlock births, the absence of faith, uh, the other, many other reasons, uh, we paper over them and try to take shortcuts that attempt to manufacture better outcomes uh, by fiat. Racial quotas simply mandate by imperial fiat that a certain percentage of a classroom or an office be of a certain color or, or, or national origin, uh, but do absolutely nothing to remedy the reason why the disparities persist when the disparities unsur unsurprisingly do not go away because we really haven't done anything to, to address the, the reason they exist, we go to even further extremes in policymaking and, and we start uh, adopting practices that put at risk at liberties and our commitments to time-tested American ideals. Our obsession leaves us vulnerable to the enemies of freedom who are all too eager to capitalize on our divisions. These enemies can be foreign, as we have seen how China, Russia, and Iran and other adversaries exploit our racial obsession and our divisions to render us helpless. But most worrisome to me um, are the domestic enemies of freedom. And by these I mean Americans intent on dismantling capitalism, uh, people who don't much like representative democracy and seek to replace it with what they call participatory democracy, which is really a way to eliminate checks and balances and put power in the hands of an, a, a small unaccountable power click. Uh, already we had these enemies of, of, of freedom in the 60s when the uh, Marxist New Left emerged and turned violent to produce such groups as the, the Weathermen, uh, the Black Panthers, the Symbionese Liberation Army, the Puerto Rican Liberation Front, and so forth. But the members of these groups found it uh, very easily, very quickly, that they couldn't uh, take over the United States because they were really very incompetent revolutionaries. The way they're on the ground uh, managed to kill each other at a much further, much higher rate than they killed the police or everyday Americans. Uh, when the FBI designated them to be uh, domestic terrorists, they went on the ground and were in hiding. But when Democrats, uh, such as um, uh, President Carter's attorney general, um, gave them amnesty, these former Marxist terrorists came from on the ground and, and started taking over the commanding heights of our culture, especially the academy. Bill Hay, uh, sorry, uh, Bill Ayers is a prime example of this if you follow his career. And today the former veterans, the veterans of this new left have trained a new revolutionary cadre uh, that is intent once again on using race to completely transform American society, to take over society through a mixture, a mixture of violence, intimidation, cultural indoctrination, and manipulation of white guilt. Uh, do you see, for example, a curiously high number of uh, former weathermen among those who fund Black Lives Matter uh, and who have trained them? The same is true for Antifa. And I wanna make clear at this point that when I talk about Black Lives Matter, I'm talking about the Black Lives Matter organizations, particularly the, the Global Network Foundation, which is the, the main group. Not the concept which I embrace. Uh, you have to be really crazy to think that black lives don't matter and not the movement, which I don't really know what it means. I guess people demonstrating, people who put signs on them. No, I mean the people who manipulate that, the organizations. Um, so you see, for example, Susan Rosenberg, a former weatherman who was serving a 58-year uh, 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 prison sentence uh, for her involvement in bombings uh, uh, until her sentence was commuted by President Clinton in his, on his last day in office. Uh, she was vice chair of the board of trustees of the Thousand Currents Foundation, uh, which mysteriously became the conduit of funding for the Black Lives Matter organization, the, the BLM GNF when she joined the board. Uh, Thousand Currents stopped being the financial sponsor of BLM GNF uh, in the fall of 2020. By 2020, uh, uh, it was really no longer needed. BLM GNF raised close to $100 million uh, as payoff for the George Floyd riots that shook the entire country and for which nobody has ended up uh, serving a prison sentence of any durable length. 
But more important, much more important, is the role, for example, that Eric Mann uh, played in the political consciousness racing of BLM GNF co-founder Patrice Collers. Eric Mann, like Rosenberg, was a former weatherman who spent time in prison, in his case, 18 months uh, for assault and battery. A few years after his release, the Cornell-educated uh, radical opened his labor community strategy center in Los Angeles. He fondly calls it the University of Caracas Graduate School of Organizing. Now, Eric Mann believes that the United States is the most oppressive society in history. Not just as Stalin's Russia, now Mao's China, places where tens of millions lost their lives because of the evil ideology called Marxism, but which Eric Mann praises because he thinks those are great places. No, to him, it's the United States that is uniquely evil. Mann says he uses his strategy center to train people on how to overthrow the imperialist state who, uh, you and I live under. Uh, that he, 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 there he trains would-be revolutionaries in both Marxist-Leninist ideology, uh, uh, but also the, the practical art of organizing. And there he trained Patrice Colors for 10 years before BLM was ever a thing. In a book he wrote in 2011, that is two years before Colors uh, co-created BLM, uh, Eric Mann congratulates himself on the fact that his center recruited Colors at the, at the tender age of 17. Recruited is the word that he uses. Uh, Mann also praises Colors as a brilliant organizer. Uh, Mann had Colors cut her teeth on the Bus Riders Union, a creation of a center. Why a Bus Riders Union? Well, Eric Mann explained that he discovered that bus riders in Los Angeles were mostly people of color and women in, and in much greater percentage than any factory floor that he could find. They were also uh, poorer than people on factory floors and, and, that, uh, and they, they were also more concentrated. So he said, well, let's, that's actually very novel. Let's organize there instead of factory floors. Um, so the, the, the trick was to attract bus riders uh, to meetings, first uh, bus and transportation related issues, then slowly beginning to immerse them in Marxist indoctrination. And that's how organizing works, by the way. Uh, you hear uh, community organizing, but that's how it works. You begin with local issues, uh, then uh, you sp expand out to national and international issues, then attract them. Uh, uh, so you first attract them, fare reduction, for example, they move to the environment to defund the police, to choke capitalism off, and then you move off to BDS and, uh, and against Israel. Uh, and what a surprise. That's exactly what Patrice Colors uh, and BLM express. Anti-capitalism, defunding the police, not just that, but defunding also, dismantling the police and prison system. No society can survive that. But, you know, news break, they want to dismantle society, so it all actually perfectly fits. Um, and, and he had her do training there, for a decade before BLM was ever a thing. And that's Colors. Garza, Alicia Garza, was not trained by a former terrorist, but by some, somebody much worse, arguably, a scholar of the thought of Antonio Gramsci. Uh, Harmony Goldberg is a, a trained cultural anthropologist and a devotee of Antonio Gramsci. She founded the School of Unity and Liberation, Seoul. That's a Marxist preparatory, similar to Eric Mann's uh, uh, strategy center also teaching Marxist-Leninism, the organizing arts, and, and there she trained uh, 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 Garza. By the way, Goldberg writes beautifully about Antonio Gramsci. She understands him really, really well. If Gramsci is your thing, I recommend her essays. But wh why is Gramsci important? Uh, it was Gramsci who understood that Marx had been wrong when he predicted that revolutions would be constantly happening because of the internal contradictions of, ca of capitalism. The, 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 the worker, the proletariat, would be constantly rising to overthrow. That didn't happen. He, he wrote this in the 20s. He said, look, it's only happened in Russia, a place, by the way, that not in, was not industrialized. It was really more of a coup as well. In fact, Gramsci wrote, the bourgeoisie in Western Europe and in the United States did not need to, to, to use force to subjugate the worker. The worker was subjugating himself by accepting the worldview of the ruling class. The worker loved his family, the worker worshiped God, was patriotic towards his nation state, and he was quite attached to the property that he had. All things that Marx has said in his manifesto that needed to be abolished. So, said Gramsci, or rather he wrote, there was a need for a period of indoctrination, of consciousness raising, uh, uh, before revolution could take, could, could take place. The institutions of civil society would need to be taken over and the consciousness of the people raised. 
So it was at Goldberg's soul uh, that Garza uh, cut her teeth, and then she was placed at another, another institution that Goldberg is associated with, the National Domestic Workers Alliance. Why domestic workers? For the same reason as the bus riders, mostly non-white women uh, who, could be, uh, who, could or who could be organized. Um, it was at Seoul, Garza has said, that she learned about Marx and Lenin and about how their thinking liberates people from their oppression. Marx, lest we forget, wrote in the manifesto in 1848 that in order to achieve revolution, we would need to have despotism. Those were his words, despotic inroads. And then a year later, he wrote that yeah, we would need to have, quote unquote, revolutionary terror. Uh, Lenin, who came after him, refined this and called for state terror, his words. In 2020, we had at least 630 recorded riots. It was the costliest disturbance in US history with damage estimated between one and $2 billion. Buildings burned coast to coast and our cities became battlegrounds. Uh, the homicide rate went up by 30%, uh, at the highest spike by, by any account in US history. This, the, the, the second closest was 1968, another revolutionary year. The media explained this away by saying, well, it was COVID. Well, no, other countries had COVID and the murder rate went down. Um, since then, we have been in some sort of trance as a nation. Uh, yesterday, uh, Marion Smith uh, described it as, as, as a, a period of delusion, that we have systemic or structural racism is now accepted fact in school districts in blue America and red America alike. I travel the country extensively. I speak in places like central Nebraska, and they tell me, Mr. Gonzalez, this is the most, this is the reddest county in America. How come this is here? And I was like, uh, no, I was in the reddest county in America last week. Uh, it, it's happening everywhere. It's happening in, in our sports leagues, our corporations, our military branches. This nonsense has become holy writ. Our indoctrination, the indoctrination that Gramsci, Goldberg, and Mann have called for is going apace. Our nation is being organized. The American people have finally risen against all this, which is the reason I remain optimistic amid all this depressing news. We have people like the great Ian Rowe, who is taking over, a, well, he's a member of, the, of a, a school uh, district in Pelham, uh, and I appreciate you for that. We have many Americans who have risen against this and say, no, not in my name. I love my child, I love my country, and I love my place of work, and you're not gonna use it uh, as, as, a, as an instrument. But let's not forget to go back and close that this is happening because we're fixated on race, beguiled by those who claim to speak on behalf of racial social justice. Rather than, than make race a less salient thing in our lives, they want to make it the thing. Maybe we should concentrate instead on the color red, uh, which happens to be the color of the, ideolo the ideology, which uh, I, have, I say is truly behind what we're going on at the moment and behind the reason why we're reordering our lives. Thank you very much. <laughs>